All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, in this lesson, we are going to be talking about Esmolol, also goes by the trade name Brevablock. So a quick history and background, uh, this medication was initially patented in 1980 and then was later approved by the FDA for medical use in 1987. Now, Esmolol is a cardioselective beta blocker that's used for short-term control of various tachycardias, perioperative hypertension and tachycardia, as well as some off-label use in things such as hypertensive emergency, ACS, aortic dissection, uh, to name a few. So the way it works is it blocks the agonist effect of the sympathetic nervous system neurotransmitters by competing for receptor binding sites. These are going to be those beta adrenergic receptors. Now, as I mentioned, it is cardioselective, so it predominantly blocks the beta-1 receptors in cardiac tissue. So that said, while at lower doses, the beta blockage is relatively cardioselective, but as the dose increases to higher doses, uh, it begins to block some beta-2 receptors as well. All right, so let's talk about some indications. So esmolol is intended for short-term control of either supraventricular tachycardia, um, so this would be to control the ventricular rate of something like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, uh, or even just an SVT in general. It can also be used for non-compensatory sinus tachycardia. So what this means is if the sinus tachycardia is resulting from compensation for, let's say, low blood pressure or hypovolemia, we obviously don't want to stop that compensation. It also can be used for perioperative tachycardia and hypertension. And then, like I mentioned, some off-label uses would be hypertensive emergency, aortic dissection, as well as acute coronary syndrome, just to name a few. We do have some contraindications for the use of this medication, though. Obviously, if the patient has any hypersensitivity to the drug or beta blockers in general, we don't want to use this in patients that have severe sinus bradycardia. Obviously, we don't want to slow that heart rate down anymore. Patients that have a first or second degree uh, or are at risk for uh, AV disassociation or also patients in third degree heart blocks, those with sick sinus syndrome, cardiogenic shock or decompensated heart failure, as well as we don't want to use this in pulmonary hypertension. If patients are taking verapamil or diltiazem, um, they both can increase the cardiosuppressant effects of beta blockers and therefore which should really be avoided if we can. We do also want to use this cautiously in patients with renal impairment, diabetes, or airway disease. So with diabetes, uh, in patients who are insulin dependent, beta blockers can prolong, enhance, or even alter the symptoms of hypoglycemia. The beta blockers can also potentially increase blood glucose concentrations as they can impair the release of insulin from the pancreatic B cells. Now for our airway diseases, here I'm talking about things like asthma and COPD. Um, like I said, that in some of our early generation beta blockers, that these ones are actually non-selective and block both the beta-1, the cardiac, and beta-2 uh, bronchial receptors. But even with esmolol, like we talked about in some of those higher doses, we do also see some of that beta-2 blockage. And so ultimately, this can, especially in these patients, lead to unwanted blockage of those beta-2 receptors and then lead to bronchospasm. And lastly, it's important to know that myocardial ischemia can come about if the medication is abruptly discontinued in patients that have coronary artery disease. All right, so now let's talk about some adverse effects here. So some common ones are going to be our hypotension as well as our bradycardia. Nausea and vomiting can also be seen as well as headache and dizziness. And then it can also cause inflammation at the infusion site. All right, so now let's talk about our dosing here. So to start, some of the common concentrations that we're going to find this, um, if we're giving it IV push, which really is not very common, um, we'll usually see this in either 10 milligram or 20 milligram per ml vials. The preferred method, though, definitely is the continuous infusion. And here, we're often going to find this in 
2,500 milligrams and 250 mLs, giving us a 10 milligram per mL concentration, uh, or 2,000 milligrams and 100 mLs, giving us a 20 milligram per mL concentration. So for the common dosing, like I said, for IV push, we really want to avoid this, and that preferred method is the IV infusion. For the IV infusion itself, our dosage range really varies anywhere from 50 to 300 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Now, in a lot of cases, we're going to give it with uh, an initial loading dose, and this can be anywhere from 250 to 500 micrograms per kilogram, given over anywhere from one to five minutes. Typically, our initial rate uh, for the infusion itself is going to commonly start at 50 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and then we can titrate it up to uh, a max of 300 micrograms per kilogram per minute. The titration orders are going to be per the provider, and we're commonly looking at either heart rate and or blood pressure goals for titration. Now for the pharmacokinetics here, so um, it does have a pretty immediate onset, um, although we generally will reach a peak within about five minutes if we're doing a loading dose. Uh, or 30 minutes if we don't do a loading dose with it. And so the duration of Esmolol is obviously going to be the duration of the infusion that we have going, uh, plus about 30 minutes after discontinuation. So when it comes to talking about the, the antidote, it's really not a true antidote because if need be, really the, we just need to stop the infusion of Esmolol. That said, like other beta blockers, uh, glucagon infusion or uh, calcium chloride can be used to offset some of the effects while we're waiting for the medication to wear off. Now, the drug is actually metabolized mainly in the red blood cells, which actually creates a free acid metabolite and methanol. Only a very small percentage of the drug is excreted unchanged in the urine, and then the metabolite that's created by the red blood cells is also excreted in urine as well. All right, so now let's talk about some of our nursing considerations. So we obviously want to be monitoring blood pressure and heart rate during the infusion. Um, a pretty significant portion of patients will develop uh, hypotension, and this can either be uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic. And as a result, diaphoresis and dizziness may accompany the hypotension. Um, like I just talked about, the hypotension can usually be reversed in the 30 minutes just by decreasing or stopping the infusion, um, but we do still want to notify the provider when this happens. Now, once the, the patient's heart rate stabilizes or their blood pressure becomes more manageable, um, then we certainly want to be collaborating with the provider to replace this infusion uh, with an alternative antiarrhythmic or antihypertensive. We do want to monitor serum electrolytes during therapy. Um, it's not common, but there have been cases of hyperkalemia that's been reported in patients with renal disease, so we want to make sure and keep an eye out for that. Now, if we are using a concentration of this drug that's greater than the 10 milligrams per ml, then we do want to administer this via a central line. And then we also don't want to use this infusion for longer than 48 hours. Make sure that you're watching that infusion site carefully for any signs of extravasation. Um, if there is, make sure that we, we stop infusing, obviously, through that line and then notify the provider immediately in order to potentially treat that extravasation. And then also make sure and check your compatibilities on this medication because it does have some incompatibility with some uh, pretty common infusions that, or medications that we may also be giving. And then finally, just relevant laboratory studies. I just talked about this here. And this is going to be for us to monitor the serum electrolytes, uh, mainly keeping an eye on potassium. All right, and that was our review of Esmolol. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that. As well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.